Donc, j'ai appris un peu de français. Ben, c'était un vent de 50 années à l'école. Uh, and I had a teacher called Monsieur Kersio, and he was really brutal with us. So <laughs> this, this left a lasting impression. But I wanted to talk to, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's very kind of you, and I'm very pleased to be here today with all of you. There are two main reasons that I really jumped at the opportunity when I was invited. The first is, um, generally, I remember being a PhD student in Zurich and in Basel. That's where I did my PhD. Uh, and seeing colleagues from Rennes always at meetings, and they were always at the forefront of the new things at the time. And that was very inspiring. And I knew at one point I was going to be in Rennes. I had to wait a bit because it was 2007, 2008 before I uh, had a sabbatical year at the invitation of Jean-Pierre and Denis Capé, who I think I see back there. <laughs> right. And um, that was a very important time for me, both scientifically, because it set me on a completely new path at the time. And also privately, I met my wife uh, at one of the meetings here, it turned out. So anyway, the beginnings of a holistic approach, the beginnings are more my, uh, my beginnings in a way, because the holistic approach was already here as practiced by the colleagues in Rennes. And I just want to start out with the outline, so a personal view. I'm going to talk about a peculiar mountain belt, which is fact, you, you know, all of you know, but it's peculiar nonetheless. New images, so some exciting new images we have in this program called Alpare, which is a European program for imaging the mantle. Why we need a new model of mountain building and what have we learned and where are we going? So these are the points on which I would like to touch during the talk. Now, we often go in the field, I'm a field-based person, so I love to observe things and I look at mountains. And the two things that always fascinated me about mountains are, first of all, what are the, farm, the forms underlying the mountains? When we look at the mountain, it's often fascinating to, to think about what's underneath it, what caused them. This is nothing new, people have been doing this now for several hundred years. But you can see in this beautiful picture from Albania, on a, taken on a field a campaign I had with a PhD a few years ago, you can see the folds. I mean, it's like reading an open book. This is one of the rare cases where we see things uh, right up front. But of course, this is never enough. We always want to go further. We ask ourselves, where do the folds go in the air? And what do they do down at depth? Part has been eroded, so we don't see it anymore because it's lost the erosional record. Other parts of it are so far down, we can't see them directly. We can see them, however, indirectly. And that's part of what I'm going to talk about today. We're also interested in the physics, the processes underlying these forms. I think these are the two main things that fascinate us about mountains. And this is now the scale that we all can see, but there is a completely different scale. You start to draw cross sections, and you do this by projecting images into the air or to depth based on the quality of the information at the surface. And you can see what we see in the picture behind us, behind us, as large as that is, is really a small picture of a, or a small part of a larger picture. And we can continue the excursion down to depth even further. Before we do that, let's look now at a completely different picture. I think a map that revolutionized our thinking. Um, it's sort of like landing on the moon in a way. This map by Heisman Tharp in 1957, which for the first time showed not just the continents, but also the ocean floors. And you can see mountains. You see mountains, in fact, beneath the surface of the ocean. And it wasn't long before people started putting pieces of the uh, picture together and came up with the idea of plates, tectonic plates, that are expressed in the morphology of the Earth. Now, at that scale, it would seem rather easy. The morphology of the Earth's uh, surface reflects the tectonics of the plates. But in fact, if we want to understand how mountains form, it's a rather more complicated story. Why is this important? Well, you look at this one picture, you can see the distribution of earthquakes. This is also not new. You can see that the different depths of the earthquakes are related to the type of the plate boundary. So the deep focus earthquakes occur along convergent margins where we have a so-called Benioff zone. And we have slabs of lithosphere which are descending into the asthenospheric mantle. 
But there are other reasons on top of this. We look at hazards, seismicity, earthquakes. We want to understand how we can predict these. Weathering soils, that's also indirect, indirectly related to mounting building processes, atmospheric effects of the mountains, uh, the exposure of exhumed material to weathering, CO2 drawdown, raw materials. So there's a whole slew of different reasons why mountain building is actually a fundamental process and will remain so also into the future in our understanding. So now Ren, why did I come to Ren? Well, I was really lucky. I was actually originally supposed to go to Stanford to work with Greg Rosa on uh, double difference imaging of fault zones, which was then what I was very interested in. I became quite ill. <laughs> that delayed everything. And I had had a conference the year before in Berlin to which Jean-Pierre had been invited. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, after I discovered I couldn't go to Stanford because the time had passed, I had been in the hospital, all of a sudden, Jean-Pierre called up and said, when are you coming? I said, what? And he said, yeah, Denis and I uh, have the CNRS uh, professorship that you can come. And I thought, this is, this is amazing. So I packed my bags and I had to come quickly because it had to be before the end of that year, which was 2007, and arrived in, uh, in the autumn. No one was around. It was completely empty. It was a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> And I just have to tell the story. So I had no mobile phone. I was one of these guys who was resistant to modern technology. So Duny kindly um, lent me the phone of his wife, which she didn't need anymore. She had a more modern one in the meantime. And I turned it on and it said, Salut Strumfett. <laughs> <laughs> That's my first memory of being the then. Sorry, I had to tell the story. So this is the way it looked without this building which is going up right next door in front of it. There was a free view of the earth sciences and um, what made it attractive from the outset were buildings like this where you could go climbing. I thought, okay, if the mountains aren't here, you bring the mountains to Rennes. <laughs> and then you read here and it says Monte en silence, which I thought was even better. You know, I like to climb quietly except when someone falls, of course, then you hear it. <laughs> But uh, these things immediately appealed to me. I thought, this is great. And these are some of the colleagues I uh, had the pleasure to interact with. Some of them are not here. They're in Berlin, in fact. They're in Potsdam, Jean Brown, for example. Um, and Pierre, this is what you used to look like, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Michel hasn't really changed very much. Um, there's Denis and Jean-Pierre. They took me on a field trip to the coast, which was beautiful. I mean, I saw some amazing exposures there also with Michel. I went in the field. So, and Peter Cobalt, of course. So all my heroes scientifically were there, and I learned an awful lot at that time. So thank you again for that experience. What did I do? Well, this was the thing. I was going to work on, on, uh, on localization of shear and with Philippe Davy, I think he's here maybe, I don't know if he's here. Anyway, um, and then I changed subject because I started talking about large-scale tectonics with Jean-Pierre and also with Tissling in Zurich at the time. And I thought, okay, there's a big problem in the Mediterranean, the Alpine Tethys, in understanding plate motions on the one hand as constrained by paleomagnetic work and on the other hand, looking at the geology, it was a clear discrepancy. So I ended up working on a whole series of paleo-tectonic reconstructions, most of it done in Pierre's office, because he had a light table. I was still so old-fashioned, I did everything by hand. And poor Pierre had to listen to me the whole time. Uh, I didn't put your picture here, because you looked even different then when you listened to me. That was amazing. But one thing I did was, I didn't put Paris on, I put Rennes on the map as a reference point. <laughs> People who are really in with the story, they know this and they look on the map and they see it. Okay. All right. So you see outlined here more or less the sutures that define the plate boundaries or the paleo plate boundaries between Eurasia and all the other plates in the South, Africa, Saudi Arabia, Indian subcontinent, and so forth. And I'm going to talk in particular about the Alps today uh, because, in fact, that's where I ended up working most of the time and uh, why this is such an interesting area and why we had such a big project over the last six, seven years in Europe. And of course, I think the thing that I don't have to point out to you, but I will anyway, is that if you look at the map, you see how arcuate these chains are. 
Um, in fact, if you look at this system in detail, you might even come to the conclusion this is a place where plate tectonics doesn't work. <laughs> I like to say that sometimes to provoke people. But it does work, but in a very different way than we think. Um, and I'm going to focus on that little area you see on the left that's outlined the Alps, which of course have been the subject of research for so long. So this is a sort of a morphologic paleo, well, not paleo, actually, present-day tectonic map of this area that I showed before in the yellow outline. And I won't count all the plates that people have defined in this particular part of the world. Just to point out this one in yellow here, the Adriatic plate, which in fact just as a, rem a remainder of, of, of a plate that was larger, which has been consumed, or one could say almost cannibalized, by origins here on either side, the Dinaric origin here, a late Cretaceous to Eocene origin, um, still ongoing but very weakly, and then of course the much younger Miocene, Apenninic origin, and the Alps proper here in the north. Now the Alps proper are a bit of an anomaly in this whole collage of different mountain belts, but they do have some interesting features that we think are worth studying. And one of the interesting uh, features also is that we have a switch in the subduction of lithosphere that happens underneath the Alps in two places. The one is at the transition from the Alps to the Apennines. I can use this here, sorry, because I'm supposed to stay in the picture, I think. Um, here, and another one which is a bit more diffuse and difficult to define over in this area here. Because the virgins of the Dinarite is opposite to the main virgins of the Alps here. And somewhere in between we have a switch. That's one of the particular peculiar features of this. Now, the crazy thing about the Alps is that basically it's two mountain chains in one. And I've tried to make this a bit more visible in this map. The colors here are the age of the metamorphism, the main metamorphism. And the greens here are basically late Cretaceous. So we have an older collision, 130 to 84 million years. We have a younger one. That's the one that you know also in the French part of the Alps here which is maybe about 35 to 20. And then in between, we have this period of prolonged oceanic, mostly oceanic subduction, uh, which is more or less along this suture line uh, here in this region down there. And then we have a late stage feature, which is a modification of the entire origin along these structures here, which I've outlined in black. And I call that the indentational phase. Now, I put arrows in here because these are the transport direction of the slices of crust that have been exposed to the surface that moved in the direction shown here. And this is one place where then we made a very large contribution um, to understanding how one interprets structures in the field. Because otherwise we could not draw pictures like this showing the transport direction of the nap with us. It's very basic work. And uh, it was the introduction here of, of the concept of S and C fabrics. So all my German students do learn some French. They learn what C means, <laughs> C seulement. And, uh, and how you interpret this, I think this is a marvelous piece of work that Dune and um, Peter Kobold and colleagues did in the 1980s, first applying it to crystallographic preferred orientation but also the scale of shear zones that really, I think, improved our knowledge immensely. So without these kind of tools that were developed um, in that period, I don't think mountain building studies would be where they are today. Uh, and so we go back to this map and suddenly we're able, based on piecing together these different motion directions, to reconstruct roughly what the path of these units were with respect to a stable Europe reference frame. And that's what I've done here. Now this is for these different phases of deformation or, or, or a genesis, if you will. You can see the Western Alps are much more complicated because of this big arc here. I won't be talking about that today. I'll be focusing more on the eastern part because here is where we think we have this possible switch in the subduction or at least in the uh, versions of the, uh, of the origin. So uh, that's the first thing I wanted to show you this is the odd business, which is quite young. It's Miocene and younger. Going on today, the indentation of part of the Adriatic plate down here into the soft orogenic lithosphere to the north and the expulsion of this off to the side, much like the Indian-Asian uh, collision 
where we have the expulsion of parts of Tibet off to the east. It's just a small scale version of the same thing basically. And this is something that we're uh, trying to understand, how that happens. So what we want to understand now, and that we've been able to say more or less what the crust is doing, the origin of the crust, is what's going on underneath? What governs this very complex behavior of mountain belts, even within a small segment of this already very complicated Alpine Himalayan chain? And to that end, a group of us in 2011 met uh, that was a group of 11 people from many different European countries, 11 different at least, European countries to decide on the next seismological campaign uh, in Europe. Uh, the previous one having been the reflection seismic profiling that was done in the late 1980s and the 90s. Um, and so it was therefore uh, then decided to use this new thing, or then fairly new array technology to harness the energy radiated by earthquakes at various depths uh, to illuminate the inside of the Earth, basically what is called a seismo seismo uh, seismological tomography. And there are different kinds of waves that are generated by earthquakes. I've just listed here the two main types, the body waves, P and S, and also the uh, surface waves, which all have different characteristics and which allow us to see different parts of the Earth lithosphere and also down into the mantle. Um, the idea of tomography is fairly simple, at least in principle. You have a lot of seismometers at the surface. You have a whole slew of earthquakes around the Earth. These generate waves which propagate through the Earth. And if we assume that we have a homogeneous medium and we can calculate based on reasonable assumptions what the velocity profile of the Earth is, we can uh, basically define what the travel time of a wave would be if it were homogeneous. Now, of course, the Earth's mantle is not homogeneous. The crust is even worse. It's very heterogeneous. This becomes a problem, but to take first things first, we have here basically an anomaly. We introduce a very slow domain and here a very fast domain. So seismically fast, usually more dense material, and usually here more le uh, less dense. So the travel time of a wave coming through this uh, mantle will be reduced with respect to an average assumed value in these domains, and here it will be added and speeded up. And you can imagine that if you take a whole array of different ray fronts radiated from earthquakes around the globe, you can start to piece together the three-dimensional shape of these anomalies at depths. And this is exactly what uh, modern seismology, at least uh, this kind of seismic tomography, does. So when this technology was first applied in the Alps, this is about 30, 30 years old, this whole approach. Um, and to the Alps it was applied already about 20 years ago in this publication here from the Zurich group that showed a very startling picture at the time. I don't show the profile here across the central and the western Alps because they more or less confirmed what we believed at the time, namely that the European plate is descending beneath the Adriatic plate. Nothing new. But here, it was just a whole different story because the anomaly, that's this black, this blue, is the positive anomaly, is interpreted to be a lithospheric slab descending depth is dipping the wrong way, I say, for European subduction. Okay? It's dipping to the north. And this completely confounded people. Um, some people just didn't believe it. They said no, there was something wrong with the method. The others who did more or less believe it, and I say believe because it's very difficult to reproduce the, the models themselves that are going into pictures like this, said, yeah, but OK, if we take this at face value, it implies that we have subduction of Adria under Europe which is the opposite of what we have in the central western Alps. How does this work? So there was a big debate and a controversy that raged, and I can't say now already that it's completely over. Nevertheless, progress was made, and another interesting secondary feature that was long ignored, I think, is the question of whether this subductive lithospheric slab is still connected to the mountain belt. So can we see the transition between this structure at depth and what we see so beautifully at the surface. To solve this problem, this group of 11 of us came with the idea 
that we just need enough array, enough stations, densely spaced to attain a much higher resolution picture down to depth. So generally speaking, the distance between the seismometers, which on average here was about 40 kilometers, should ensure at least that kind of resolution going down to about 400 kilometers depth. This was the idea, and it was a huge, uh, a huge investment. First of all, we used uh, permanent stations, which are here shown in red, and everything else shown in white were um, mobile stations that were acquired. Some countries had them already, and they were put into a big pool to make for about two, uh, 630 stations over the whole Alpine chain. And where there is uh, water, the French and the German colleagues got together and deployed a series of ocean bottom, bottom seismometers. Uh, so this is unprecedented at this density. Now there had been array technology applied to this kind of problem before in the US. The US array was in fact something very similar over a huge area, so the spacing was very wide between the stations and the resolution not nearly as good as here. So this was quite a radical experiment uh, when we started out. So this just shows you by country more or less where these stations were gone, but I have to say it was exemplary how the country lent stations to each other to fill the gaps to make sure that this spacing was quite homogeneous. Not only did the spacing have to be homogeneous, but the instruments also had to be compatible with each other because different uh, acquisition periods had led to different quality stations or different kinds of stations. This was more or less made uniform in this area. So you can see more or less where these stations were made and the good news also is that some of the stations have been made permanent in the meantime so in fact we have actually increased the uh, quality of observations that we're now getting the whole time based on this big European experiment. These are just a few of the colleagues I think who stand in the forefront of this effort at least from the geophysical side here. I have to say, however, there were many, many people. There were 17 institutions, uh, I should say 17 countries, 64 institutions involved in this, so hundreds of people. And I'm not even going to start to talk about the problems of storing this huge amount of data, right? terabytes of information, uh, which, which are being archived as we speak. Not just on land, but also uh, on the sea. The, this is just the German ship. I think the French ship has a much better name. It's called Pourquoi Pas. Great name, huh? Why not? So, <laughs> I didn't show this, but I was on some of these cruises here. on Paul uh, from Grenoble and Heidegger Kopf from Kiel were two of the people in charge of this side of the project. And, uh, and this is now taken off the coast of Montenegro, this particular uh, voyage that, that I was on. Okay, now seismological methods, I'm not a seismologist, maybe some of you in the room are, so forgive me if I uh, say something that's maybe not quite correct. But I'm just going to show you three of a whole slew of methods that were used to image the mantle and parts of the crust beneath the Alpine mountain chain. The first and foremost were teleseismic P wave tomography, so you take these rays that emanate from earthquakes around the globe, that have a very high incidence angle with the surface make it very hard to uh, take into account the heterogeneity of the crust. This is itself where most of the deviation between these models I think result from is the crustal correction. But basically uh, this particular one here which is from the, from the group in Bochum they use three different models here to try to uh, obtain a, a, a clearer picture of the cross mantle transition in the context here of this uh, mantle tomography. Surface wave tomography, this was done by mostly by the Paris group and also the Grunewald group who are experts in this field. And uh, in my group in Berlin, I have a colleague, uh, Emmanuel Fisle, who in fact studied and worked with both of these groups. This here is uh, very good for shallow level resolution, not so much for down, uh, down deeper. Down to about 200 kilometers, we can get images that are interpretable. Below that, the resolution just falls off because the period of the waves becomes so large. And what has become very important now for interpreting the crust is local earthquake tomography. So very similar to this, except that we use earthquakes that are generated in the area. Now, this is a problem in the Alps because the Alps are basically, in parts, a dead origin, or very young but dead, or dying. So the earthquake activity is very diffuse compared to other origins like the Himalaya and it's not nearly as active. Nevertheless, if you leave the 
uh, seismometers out in the field long enough, it's like a camera, you open up the, uh, you know, the aperture and you leave it open for a long time. So you get a lot more data. And this is the way this problem was taken into account. So these are the main methods. Uh, we used other methods as well, but I won't go into those. And the result, very generally, the Earth's mantle is bloody complex. It's really not easy at all to interpret. But I'll just show you a few highlights. So these are now two cross-sections across these two very different areas, one here across the Western Central Alps and here across the Eastern Alps going into the Apennines. And you can see already a big difference. Uh, these are now interpreted. One can argue about where you draw these lines between uh, lithosphere and the stenosphere. But what's important is just to look at the general shape of the anomalies. The, the blue anomalies are generally considered to be high-velocity mantle lithosphere. And you can see it's more or less continuous with a possible slight discontinuity here, but here very clearly discontinuous in this area here. Okay, where you draw this line is anyone's guess, it's not clear, but here it's quite clear that you have uh, an area in between which we have interpreted as upwelling a stenosphere in this particular case. So the Eastern Alps, according to this interpretation, are not only is the slab uh, disconnected, it's hanging down there, the depth of maybe top maybe 150 kilometers only, and goes all the way down possibly into the mantle transition zone. This here is more or less continuous. And I've drawn in the surface geology just to be able to orient the geologists in the audience. So this here is the suture, this green here is the alpine testing suture. So that was one interesting picture. Here's another one. I think this is amazing. You can see processes in the act of happening. Um, here now two very closely spaced profiles across the Western Alps. And you can see here we, we, we see clearly detached evidence. Uh, this is something confirming already what had been shown before by other groups. But in this area we think we're in the act of catching this uh, necking or this uh, dropping off of the slab, of the detaching slab. So I'm just showing you a few of the many images that were produced. Uh, also, of course, we were in contact with our colleagues in France from Grenoble. And just to show you the correspondence, because they had been working with the colleagues in China, this chief Alps, which I'm sure you've heard of, which was uh, basically producing very similar images, interpreted slightly differently. Uh, this is the difference, but in fact the uh, results are fairly robust that we have so far. The difference is that images like this were generated along swaths of stations, whereas we had this very broad coverage. So we can now really generate a three-dimensional image of what goes on at depth. And this is what I'll show uh, in the next slide after this. I just wanted to show you this. This is now using surface waves with depth slices. So these are political boundaries. My geophysicist colleagues love political boundaries. They don't put the geological boundaries on there, which I find really a shame sometimes. I help them out sometimes. But anyway, you can see this is France, here's Switzerland, here's Germany. You can more or less see the Alpine chain very nicely at the very shallow depth. But as you go down to about 130 kilometers, 180, the high velocity domain is more or less centered around Switzerland and Western Austria, which is the center of the Alps. And we interpret this to show basically already also what the other method was showing us, namely that we have attachment of the big European slab beneath the Central and Western Alps, but not so much in the Eastern Alps. Here we lose it entirely. So there's a correspondence of the uh, images that we have using very different methods. This is now just a three-dimensional picture, or a kind of rendition of what we now think the alpine subsurface looks like. So here you see in different colors the uh, affinity of the crustal units. This is the old origin that I mentioned before, the Cretaceous part of the origin. Here is the Paleogene part of the origin in the west. And here the detachment complete of this slab descending down to below the mantle transition here at 440, 420 kilometers. And here it's still attached in the Central Alps. So this is the uh, current interpretation that we have that is largely co corroborated also by the other groups that have been working on this. So we combined all the sections we had to develop a kind of a map view of where the descending lithospheric slab is still attached to the mountain above and where it's no longer attached. 
And if you, and these are all the profiles we use. So we were just, you know, COVID. COVID was for us a blessing because we didn't have any other work. We just did this. <laughs> so we, we mapped out basically areas at a slice, a depth slice of 240 kilometers where this slab is still attached to the origin and other areas where it's detached over here, for example, or semi-detached. You, you see the central area still. This is also where we have upwelling of the mantle in this area at 240 kilometers depth. And that's a very interesting thing if you start considering this data now in the context of completely different data sets. And I'll show you one of them. Seismicity. It's long been a big mystery why we have lower crustal earthquakes going on in central Switzerland here, okay, in this area. You can see it's only in this area. We don't have it here so much and here practically nothing. In this area here, I think now that the interpretation becomes clearer, the slab is still hanging down there. It's exerting a bending moment on the whole foreland. And this, I think, is the explanation that we can have, at least to a first order approximation, of why we have the earthquakes where we have them. And you can see already how this kind of data is helping us to improve our probabilistic uh, determinations of where the earthquakes are. Another feature is mantle flow. I haven't talked about the asthenosphere so far. Um, but one of the interesting things that are so pursued by groups both in Germany and France is to understand the orientation of the olivine as it flows. And this is done by correlating the splitting characteristics with the polarization characteristic of seismic waves and correlating that with the, um, with the direction of the crystallography in the olivine grains to make it very simple, or I hope simple. And you can see these long lines show the flow directions. The depth constraints is very poor with this method, so we don't really know within what depth interval, but it's quite deep. Um, and then you superpose that now on the new slab anomaly map. So this is where the slabs are at this depth of about 90 kilometers. And suddenly things start to make a bit of sense. You can see that the flow here is very strong in these areas here between the slabs, especially here in the east where we don't have the slab anymore at 90 kilometers depth. It's down below. And the picture that we now contentedly come up with, just for these two examples here, is that in fact the asthenosphere is flowing around these slabs, at least at that depth interval. Okay? And here I guess it's no surprise because the Pannonian Basin is opening up behind the Carpathians, which are also a Miocene, basically a Miocene or a Neogene origin. And the space is being filled by the mantle which is flowing into it, but within the Alps already, okay? in the slab tears. So now you ask, what about the crust? Okay, this is what we have at the surface. And we come to this big problem. What's going on between these amazing features now at depth and what we see at the surface? And in particular, this problem of the indentation, which I mentioned briefly before. I'm not going to talk about this one. This is a later one, slightly. So this is about 23 million years and younger, as dated by the thrust at the surface and by the exhumation of these units here in this tectonic window called the Tauern window. And, um, and we have this big displacement. Now this is again where then played a key role in at least furthering our understanding or opening our eyes to the kinematics of the whole situation. And there were two sets of models, one done in the early 90s by Lothar Rochbach and the colleagues here in Rennes. And then later, very similar but with slightly different boundary conditions by uh, person who worked with me for about 11 years altogether before he went to Paris, maybe you know some of him, uh, Claudio Rosenberg and all that. And what they showed was basically by taking a very simple uh, arrangement of driving this wedge here into the soft orogenic lithosphere, you can generate structures more or less like what we see in the field. Conjugate, conjugate sets of shear zones here, sinistral here, dextral. Uh, folds that are very similar to what we see in the tower window and then the extrusion, in this case Miocene extrusion of the entire lithosphere off to the, to the east. The question then is what happens at depth? I mean this is just a, basically a two-dimensional model, rheologically stratified, so that was realistic, but we don't know how this relates to this so-called wrong way subduction. I mean what role does that play in this whole thing or the slab breakoff? So to that end, we supplemented this 
very nice array of seismometers, very dense array. In fact, it's not shown here properly. They have a spacing of only four to 10 kilometers, so much denser than in other parts of the origin to improve the resolution yet more. And this is a thankful job because the seismicity is very much higher in this part of the Alps than it is in the others. In fact, we have ongoing conversions, albeit quite slow. One to two millimeters per year only is just above the resolution level of GPS. But you can see it nonetheless in this part of the origin. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember that there was a big earthquake in 1976 in Friaul that killed almost a thousand people right in here in this area there. So it's an active area. And uh, this is where we deploy the seismometers. And I'm just going to summarize some of the results that we have that reveal more about the crust and its relationship to the mantle. First of all, this beautiful gravity map that was generated by the colleagues working internationally in an exemplary fashion to generate this, this big map here of the gravity field. And you can see already the most negative values here where we have the root of the Alps, not a surprise. And the values here generally increase as we go off to the east. That's because the moho is rising up. So the crust is becoming thinner as we come away from the Alps and go into the Carpathians in this area. No big surprise there. And here is an origin parallel profile. So this is unusual. Most profiles go across the origin. I will show you this one down here and the next one comes through here. And you can see already I took the 6.8 kilometer per second uh, isovelocity line. It's a kind of a proxy for the transition between intermediate and lower crust. This is the Moho proxy, okay, at 7.25. And you can see that the lower crust here is thickened in this area, right in here. It's expanded here. This is the geology of the surface on the same scale. And this here is where we infer a bulge of lower crust. And this is a new feature because in the West we'd known about an indenter before, so a piece of lower crust that had been invented, but not this kind of a bulge feature, which you then see much better in uh, this cross section right here. So the next slide shows you that. And this is now two interpretations that we have of the local earthquake tomography showing the ISO velocity lines. And here we don't know yet really whether this is European crust or whether it's Adriatic. We haven't done this. We're in the process of balancing it right now as well as we can because it's a three-dimensional problem. But the main feature which I find interesting is that it's south of where we have the main exhumation. So I think that basically there are two parts of indentation in not quite the same age. Um, this may be a later feature and I think in fact that most of this here is Adriatic because we can balance the amount of shortening airily uh, with the amount of short we have at the surface. But that work's still in progress. So if we now try to stand back from all these new data, what does this tell us about mountain building in this very classical origin? You know, it's, it's been studied for so long you think there's nothing new and then you go there with this new method and you find something different. I think we need a new model at least for the Alps because we have different lithospheric structure in the east and the west that holds true for the mantle, as I think I've shown, but also for the crust. And then a very curious feature I'll just briefly touch on is that we have switching orogenic fronts in the east. It's absolutely bizarre, these uh, eastern and southern Alps. And this is what I mean. So these are two transects now across the central part, and this here across the eastern part. And you can see already the small distance of maybe 150, 200 kilometers is already a really different structure. Um, here we have this lower crustal indenter in the west and in the east we have this bulge. One can discuss how one draws this. I've taken this section from Claudio. Um, but uh, you can see quite clearly also that the maximum exhumation, which is tertiary, is in a different part. And here it's sitting on top of the lower plate, uh, the upper plate, sorry. Uh, and here it sits much further to the north in the core of the origin clearly on top of what is the downgoing plate. So a very different configuration. That's one thing. The other thing has to do with this orogenic versions. Okay? When this, this part of the origin is propagating as a properly behaved origin to the north, from south to north, until about 19 million years. And then it stops. 
And it, it, unlike the Western part, it stops more or less. That is to say, it, it retreats into the origin, so you have other sequence thrusting, but not very much displacement. And about the same time, we have two other things that happen. The Cowan window starts to exhume, and what's more surprising is these faults start to propagate to the south. And this is uh, just showing you, I've mapped the age of these faults onto this GPS map produced by my colleagues at INGD and Nicholas Apolloni and his colleagues here, and they've shown very nicely, you can see the bright spots where we have um, increased or augmented convergence rates. So these are uh, GPS-derived uh, vectors here with respect to a fixed European uh, reference frame. So the retro wedge more or less becomes a pro wedge. Yeah? It's, a, it's a complete switch, whereas the pro wedge, the previous main pro wedge, shuts down. And it starts to behave, in fact, in some ways like a retro wedge. So one way to explain this, the tradi uh, traditional, the new traditional since 2003 was to invoke this switch in the polarity of the origin. So we went from this kind of very generalized system with a singularity point. This point here, singularity doesn't ship. What happens is the Adriatic plate starts going down. But I hope I've showed you that for two reasons this model doesn't work. The first reason is that the slab is disconnected. We just don't know anymore really where it comes from. But there are hints. If you look at the length of the slab, I don't know if you remember the image I showed you, it goes down about two, three hundred kilometers. Now there is no way that we have this amount of shortening in the Southern Alps. Uh, the conservative estimates are 50 to 70 kilometers, but no more. Okay, so that's the other reason. That model just doesn't work. Okay, <laughs> so that's more or less, and I have to, say that I had to change my mind in this because I also published a paper where I found good geological, I thought, ge geological evidence for this, but in fact had to correct it. This is now the new model and I think it has to do with the role of the crust and not so much the mantle. Once the mantle is gone, the dynamics of the wedge become very different and this is the, the bulge that I was showing you. You basically, I've tried to schematize it. Um, allow the origin to expand outwards because the singularity point shifts up into the crust and completely changes the dynamics of thrusting so that we activate here the southern part and it goes to the south. It's very schematic and we're in the process of trying to model this but uh, this is this is future story. So I think it really has changed our view now of how slab breakoff can affect the stability of an origin. What have we learned? So we can compare this to other studies that have been done more or less in the same time in other parts of the world. Uh, this is our picture. This is a recent picture of the Western Himalayas and Pamir, where you can see a very similar thing under the Hindu Kush and Pamir. These are the earthquakes showing areas where, in fact, the slab seems to be dropping off. And if you look at the geometry of these, these anomalies, and of course the resolution is a problem. We have smearing effects in the seismology. However, if you take them at face value, they don't look like slabs. They look like blobs of material. And that raises questions about the rheology of the lithosphere as it descends into the mantle. This is something that we're just beginning to touch on. Um, subductive slabs are detached from the origin of the lithosphere, even in young origins. These are fairly young, some of them ongoing. This triggers contrast to the mountainous structure. Okay, that's what we've, one of the things we learned. Now, where are we going? Well, we have successor experiments that are already underway, taken uh, ahead again by uh, colleagues um, um, in different places here. This is Alpare, and you can see now some of the mobile stations have already moved to the east, and there's a new campaign here called Avria Array, which is going to cover the Balkan states. This is not an easy undertaking, but it's uh, already uh, a long way. Getting funding for this is not easy. Alpare actually worked thanks to the cooperation of the colleagues, because we did not get EU money. We just had the individual scientific for, uh, foundations that were supporting it. But this is already uh, uh, going ahead. Then we're taking advantage of the wealth of data that we have already from Alpare. So I have a colleague here, a uh, young colleague, Peter McPhee, who's a postdoc in my group. And we're trying to reconstruct the Alps again much more carefully based on the shortening estimates we have and then compare it with what we know with the subsurface. And on a much bigger scale, um, to, together with Erin Deux-Pecton, 
who has been working on this for a number of years. I think some of you know her from the time she was here, but she's done a marvelous job of taking ahead what I was starting already in 2007, much more sophisticated because now she's using G-Plate software, which we didn't have at the time. Secondly, also much better constraints on plate motions of Iberia and of Africa and the main players in the, in the whole dance of the plates. So this is another thing that's going ahead, which is very, uh, very good. Then what we're interested in now is surface mantle coupling. What effect does this have on surface processes? So I again show you this map that I showed before, where we have attachment of the slabs and where we have detachment or partial detachment. How does this relate to erosion rates? And this becomes really interesting and it's counterintuitive. I, at the moment, don't have a good explanation. But you can see the erosion rates here as calculated using several methods by Baron et al. The reference is unfortunately erased here. But we have in the areas where the slab is still attached, we have the highest erosion rates. And where you, I would expect it actually to be the opposite. I would expect where you have the slab pulling down, the mountains wouldn't be coming up, but we know the highest mountains are here. There are rather young exhumation here in the uh, massive externe, in the external massifs. And here where we have the break off underneath, this is where we have the lowest rates. So something to be looked at more carefully is superposing different information uh, onto the same map and seeing what we can do with this. We can talk about this later. Or this by the group in Tübingen, basically using climate models to go backward in time and predict what the climate was like in the Pliocene and in the Miocene. And then relate these precipitation rates in this particular case to erosion rates and see if that somehow correlates with what we know from the record in the sedimentary basin. That's what we're uh, doing right now. So I'll just end with this last slide because in fact I'm over my time. Um, uh, this quote from Wegener which I translated that in fact is a plea for combining different methods but with a coherent goal in mind to understand these processes that are underlying in this case mountain building um, and try to arrive at a much better understanding of what's, what's going on down there. And so many, many thanks again for the invitation and for this marvelous group of uh, people doing this research over the years here. And I hope that, I think this is my last one, thanks and cheers for the next 30 years. <laughs>